Have you ever had a time since you started rope flow where your practice just felt kind of flat? Maybe you went weeks or months and you just didn't feel drawn to pick up the rope or when you did pick it up, you just didn't know what to practice. You kind of rinsed and mastered all the patterns you already learned and you just didn't really know where to go from there. I've had plenty of weeks and months where I've gone without wanting to pick up the rope and each time something's brought me back to pick up my rope and my practice has got reinvigorated and I've enjoyed it and had a passion for rope flow that I felt like as never before and I've got deeper with the rope each time. So if you think that's where you're at right now or just to preempt in case that might be you in the future, I thought I'd make a video where I talk about all the facets that I feel make up a complete and well-rounded rope flow practice so that we're approaching it from as many different angles and dimensions so that we can go as far and get the most out of a rope flow practice as possible. So here I've made a list of eight tenets that I feel make a complete and well-rounded rope flow practice. If Liver King hasn't ruined the word tenet for you. Tenet number one, I'm calling this basics plus. So the basics would be the first patterns that we learn, overhand, underhand, and the dragon roll. Basics plus is then the next patterns that we learn almost directly after that is the matador and the sneak. Now these two alone have so much variety that can be spent, years of her lives can be spent practicing and drilling and perfecting and developing these movements. Someone as an example like Alpaca Flow, who is the master door, <laughs> master door, is the master of the matador, if there ever was one, still it seems like he spends every day still drilling matadors and transitions and playing with that. Tenant number two, one arm flows. For me, I like to start most of my rope flow sessions with the rope just in one hand, kind of imagining it's a sword or a lightsaber and just flowing through, following the way it's kind of leading my body to go, swapping hands, doing some with the, with the opposite hand. This way it just allows me to kind of warm up the body gently in a, in a more isolated manner on the shoulder, but then I can still lead the body into nice movements. And on top of that, it's a lot less intense than the two-handed practice, less likely to hit ourselves with it it allows us to work on movements and shoulder mechanics that we're going to put into the two-handed practice, but we just get to do them in that more forgiving way with the one hand. So if you don't do much of this, I definitely recommend as a warm-up or as part of every session, you should do some one-arm practice. Tenant number three, and this is the one I feel is the single most overlooked aspect of a complete rope flow practice. This is what I call traveling drills. It's where you take the rope for a walk, this is not so much on the spot pivots and turns. This is end to end. You've got, you know, 20 meters, 30 meters to walk between, between two trees, two lampposts, the length of your garden. You pick up the rope, you choose a pattern or a connection series of patterns, and you walk from point A to point B doing that pattern and just try to allow the rope to guide the body, to uh, guide the ribs, the shoulders, the arms, the hips, whatever it is to do that travel. Now in every session I coach, every workshop I do where I teach people in person, I always put traveling drills in there. And often it seems to be the most light bulb moment for people in, in of the session. And one of the moments they go, I'm really gonna take that away and make sure I do more of them. I've never done that before. And so something as simple as swinging the overhand rope flow pattern and then walking with it and sinking the arms and the legs as we go, then we can build up to the underhand dragon rolls, 180s, 360s, we can do sneaks. There's all sorts of aspects we can put into these traveling drills. That's why in a lot of the new course Fluidity 2 I just released, I put a lot of traveling drills in there to try and break people out of this pattern or habit of staying on the spot with their practice and just learning to sync and connect the arms and the legs when we do this, when we walk step after step like this. It really helps the body to integrate even more so than on the spot what the rope can do for us. Tenant number four in building a well-rounded and complete rope flow practice, I'm calling turns, twins, twins, <laughs> twists and spins. So in the beginning, we're learning rope flow, we're learning one pattern at a time, we're on the spot, maybe two feet grounded, maybe we're starting to weight shift side to side. We want to start to think about transitioning between the sides to something like a drag and roll pivot, 180, we're turning on that front leg, at A360, we're turning on that front leg. Then you've got to move like, the Billie Jean, where we're starting to twist, the feet stay grounded, but we're transitioning between patterns from drag and roll on one side to drag and roll on the other side, up to something like a drag and roll 360, where we're actually doing a spin and 360 jump in the air. I think this is great to test our balance, our weight shift ability, our understanding of the mechanics of the rope, which we want 
to stay vertical while we turn and twist and spin horizontal, we're working like two cogs. One vertical cog is the rope and the horizontal cog is the body. If the rope starts cutting, if we, as we twist, we still force the rope to twist as well on our axis, that's when it doesn't happen. So as we're learning to turn and twist and spin, and we think about keeping the rope vertical while I turn, it teaches the body fast spin mechanics. It's physics really, if my shoulders are wide and level and I try to turn, I'm gonna be taking up a lot of space, I'm gonna turn very slowly. If I can shrink the distance of my shoulders from the center line as by verticalizing as I twist, I'll be able to twist a lot faster. And this is mechanics we can think about when we're doing rope flow, when we're practicing moves like the Billie Jean, like the drag and roll pivots, like the Shuriyukens. These moves really, really help us to understand the mechanics of spinning. Tenant number five, and perhaps the most frustrating and annoying of all the tenets I'm gonna list here today, and that is making sure you have a behind the back practice. So in every session you do, as with all of these mentioned, you should probably think about doing some of them in every session or in most sessions. This is no exception and possibly one that you should do in every session. So when I say behind the back patterns, we're talking cheetah's tails, we're talking cheetah doors, we're talking back mills, peacocks, peter doors, and whatever other crazy patterns people have developed from there. But essentially, we're learning to have control, we're mapping an area of the body that we have probably never mapped or very rarely ever map do we learn to have control in a spot that we cannot see ourselves and it's behind our body's center line. We're trying to, and even crossing, sometimes even crossing the midline behind the center line. This really is no man's land for our brain in terms of mapping and having control in space and proprioception and all those good things. So when we're doing something like the cheetah's tail and it's constantly hitting us, and then maybe we're learning the timing, the sequencing, we're learning the positioning of the hands behind the back, the, the direction the wrist points in, syncing it with the ribs and the spine. This is mapping a whole new range of area and motion for us that is completely alien and no man's land to probably most of us. And we're starting to color in possible positions that the body could be in. Just think about all the muscles around the spine that are now getting contracted and recruited, the rhomboids, the traps, the rectus spinae, the lats, all these muscles that we maybe work at more lengthened positions, but we're actually working them in their kind of short range, getting good healthy blood flow whilst we're learning control as well. I'm an, I like exploring, if you like exploring too, explore your body, exploring these positions behind the back is probably gonna give you the most bang for the book of the least explored territory within your body. So that's why chef's favorite, one of the best ones of these, have a behind the back practice. Tent number seven, transitions and flows. Now when I say flows, I just mean a series of patterns that we chain together and then we chain that and loop that over and over as one kind of sequence. Something like David Weck's 117, which is a, a series of seven beats and different patterns coming together, Oban Sneak, Home Run Transition, Matador, all within that one seven beat move and we loop it as one flow or the KO combo with four different patterns in there of the underhand uppercut, the high drag and roll, the drag and hug into the ace over to one side and then we can loop back through the home run back to start again. Now what I like about flows is you can start to get creative there. We can start to think about when I'm doing this pattern, what does that lead me to want to do? What could come next after this? And then how could I maybe get back to that pattern in a fluid and smooth manner? When we're doing that, we're learning to transition between patterns. And for me, one of the keys that goes unnoticed when it comes to mastery is transitions. This can be anything from music, singing, gymnastics. My experience comes from parkour. Just something, say a front flip. When you practice a front flip in isolation, okay, you can get so good. But when you learn to do something into a front flip or something out of the front flip, that is when we really learn to master the front flip, not just training it in isolation, because we have to become precise and think about what's coming next. But we also can't think about that too early, because if you think about it too early, you're gonna mess up the move you're in. So that is why I think it's important. It's kind of covered in some of the other patterns when we're doing traveling drills, when we're doing turns and twists, we're thinking about transitioning already to some degree in those. 
but I just wanted to put it as its own point because I think flows allows us freedom to get creative and I'd love to see if you guys can come up with some flows as well. And just the idea of transitioning in general will really help master moves. Now tenant number seven is possibly of all the eight tenets, the one I focus on the least, but there is a decent sized portion of the rope flow community that do this, that I see do this. So I wanted to give it time and space in case it's something that appeals to you. And I do play with it a little bit and maybe it's something I will do more in the future. And that is what I'm calling tricks. When I say tricks, I mean things like uh, releases and catches and, and wraps with body parts. So for me, an example that I do do is something like the wax off where I allow the rope to wrap up. I move across the rope on wraps. People take this to much more extremes and they do longer wraps where it wraps several times and they do wraps in all sorts of wild and wonderful positions. And then things like releases and catches where people, they call it a mic release. I think it comes from uh, jump roping where they release one handle, they'll swing it, they'll catch the handle and land fluidly into a pattern. Now for me, I just, like I say, I haven't spent much time on this. It didn't seem, I like to focus on full body functionality when I'm releasing the rope I'm kind of stood stationary waiting to catch it, but that doesn't mean there isn't a place for this. It's like a like a big cat, you know, like a, a cat plays with a cat toy and they move fast and they can like react and dive on a laser or a piece of string, whatever it is. It's kind of like that. A simple release in the cats that I've played with that I actually do really enjoy and I do pretty much every session right now is just in the matadors, both overhand and underhand, a nice release around the hand and then a simple re-grab and catch. I put it in the new fluidity course because once I learnt it, I do use it regularly, like I just said. Now our eighth and final tenet when it comes to having a complete and well-rounded rope flow practice is break the rules. <laughs> With rope flow in the beginning, we want rules. It helps us understand the practice. It helps us get the most from rope flow. Things like the cardinal law, things like how we hold the rope. We have it in two hands. We have the rope tick the floor. I think it's perfectly good to break these rules in many ways. It's just the most important thing is that we're conscious when we do it. So when we break the cardinal law, we know we're breaking the cardinal law. When we hold the handles upside down in a dagger grip, we know we're doing it and that's part of our practice. Other examples of breaking the rules, something like a meteor hammer, which comes from, I think, the three beat weave or wave in, in poi, we're holding the rope completely different and we're doing something different, kind of breaking the rules of traditional rope flow, but we're still challenging ourselves and using the rope in a fun way that we're enjoying and we're developing skills with. So those are my eight tenets of having a well-rounded and complete rope flow practice. I hope it's given you some ideas and inspiration the next time you pick up your rope. Now, I've just released my new rope flow course, Fluidity 2 which is a continuation and a sequel to Eight Weeks to Fluidity, which is my beginner's course. And I currently have a spring sale with 25% off everything, all ropes and courses, including the new course. So if you want to learn from me, there's a great place to start. Now's a good time. If you're watching this video after the fact, if you sign up to the newsletter on the website, there's a 10% discount code. So you're not missing out completely. But just wanted to let you guys know, New course out, all the nice footage you hit seen here is taken from the new course. I think it's great to learn rope flow in person if you can, but if you can't, I don't think there's a better online resource than what I have created. I've put a lot into it. It's getting great feedback and results for people so far. Maybe I'll see you in there. If not, I'll see you in the next video. Godspeed. Mm -hmm.